Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, depending where you're tuning in. Good to uh, get to see all of you this fine Saturday, uh, November 12th, it looks like, according to the calendar, 8 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, Pacific Daylight Time. I have no idea. We still do this daylight savings things, which uh, apparently they're trying to rule out, but they've been saying that for a lot of years now. So we will see. Anyway, let's uh, let's tune in and have a chat. All things business, all things marketing. Let me know whereabouts you're tuning in from, what's going on, and uh, and we'll get to some Q and A here in just a second. So, my friend, good to see you. We got our we got our old familiar faces here, which is great. Always fun to uh, always fun to see. Uh, Faisal, good to see you. Just Cicero, this is truly epic. Whoa, that's a appreciate that. I'm not even sure what's epic yet. Hopefully, there's more epicness to come. Um, and while people tune in, we'll, uh, we'll dive right in here a little bit. We'll, we'll answer them more in depth as we keep going, but, uh, let's get things rocking and rolling. So Abdallah trying to close a tough prospect, any advice on how to deal with them? Also, please do a sales book video or list. Ooh, sales book video. That'd be interesting. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good sales books. We should probably do some of those at some point. I've got an advertising book list with like 42. I've also got my reading list, which has a ton of books there. If you go to um, aerh.co slash reading, I think you'll find it there. But advice on how to close a tough prospect. This is a tough one because it really depends on why they're tough. Um, my, I'm going to give you the, the kind of pithy answer and then maybe we can circle back to this one closer at the end. Here's the deal. When it comes to a tough prospect, if you're having a hard time closing them, Normally, here, I'm going to shut the window. My kids are outside playing. Just, uh, there we go. Loud, loud, loud kids. Um, my, my thing is always like, well, we should have done better marketing in the first place that we don't have to close people or, or, or do all kinds of like objection handlings and overcome this. That's my answer. Like 99% of the time is I never like to close anyone. I never want to be like, well, you should do this because if I haven't done a good enough job marketing ahead of time, then I end up in a situation where I have to do like hardcore sales. And I don't like that personally. That's not my style or personality. Uh, there is a time and a place where you might need to be a little more assertive and aggressive, but that's my, um, that's my answer is like, I'd move on and find the next prospect. We can, we can talk more about specifics later. Tenno, let's go. Good to see ya. Eat French fries. Absolutely. Cause they're delicious. Uh, good morning from New York. Good morning. Eat French fries. Mew Company. Hi. Hey, good to see ya. Ah, Kevin, glad you could make it. It's like you've got this set on an alarm, my friend. That's awesome. I don't think if I think if ever we do one of these things and you're not here, I'm gonna I'm gonna wonder. I'll wonder where you are. I hope you're okay. Uh Blake, do I offer coaching for real estate agents? I don't offer any coaching consulting one on one at this time, due mostly to uh commitments and time constraints to other things. However, there is a course and training available here, which may or may not be what you're looking for. So all the details are there. Uh, but as far as one on one stuff, yeah, not right now. And Keat, can you please make a video on different types of ad campaigns that one can run on Facebook meta platforms? Yeah, I have so many on this already. Um, so many, have you seen them all? They're there. So go Google Adam Earhart Facebook ads videos and you'll find all of them. Um, thanks. You're welcome. More good stuff to come. Philip, how do you remember who your ideal customer is? Do you write down a profile? So interesting question. I think the, the short answer here is like, if you have to remember who they are, then you haven't done a good enough job of understanding who they really are. Like by the time that you understand who they are, they should be so ingrained into your mind. That they're just like concreted in there that you'll never forget them. You can visualize them. They, you wake up thinking about them. You think about their problems. You are them. You, you get in their shoes. So yeah, I mean, a profile is helpful to start because it's going to help make sure that you're concentrating on the right things that are relevant to your market, like age, gender, income, occupation, geographic details, interests, attitudes, beliefs, all of the usual things that go into an avatar. Um, but like once that's done, you should have a pretty good understanding of who they are and you, you shouldn't need to reference it. Um, that said, I don't mind, especially if you're bringing in other marketers to help you. It's helpful to give them something and be like, hey, this is who I'm going after. Greg, morning from Kansas. Morning, Greg. Good to see ya. I, it's funny. Every time I see um, places like, say, Kansas, I always remember... I always say the same thing of like, hey, I was in Wichita or whatever. And then everybody that tunes in all the time is going to be like, yes, Adam, we know you're in Wichita a lot. I need new stories from Kansas, but I don't have any. So one day. 
Antonio, how do you create content around pain points struggling to come up with content ideas? Okay, so how do you create content around pain points? You create, well, first of all, most content should be pain point driven anyway. So I think, let me rephrase that, is essentially the, the latter part of the question is what we have to focus on, which is how do you come up with content ideas? And the way to come up with content ideas is by content consumption. So you need to consume a lot of different content around your market and also inside and outside of your industry. So you can get ideas. You can see what other people are doing. You can uh, trigger inspiration. I keep a pen and paper handy all the time. So I'm always writing down notes and ideas and things that I can create content on. Uh, and then the other thing is you just start creating content and you kind of see what resonates, what doesn't, what people are interested in. You double down on the topics that are performing best. Uh, but it really all starts from that that first thing of like, all right, well, we've got to consume so we can create. The problem is most people get stuck in the vortex of consumption. So all they do is end up consuming and they never create anything. So that's step one. Step two is talk to people. Find out, hey, what are you struggling with right now? When it comes to blah, whatever it is you do, what's your number one biggest problem that you're facing right now? That's my favorite question, by the way. When it comes to whatever your business or industry is, what's the number one biggest problem or obstacle that you're experiencing that's holding you back? And then you make content about that and how to overcome it. Good morning. Good morning again. Bruce. Good. Oh, how do I? Hang on one sec. Buttons. There we go. Bruce. Good morning from Denver. Good morning, Bruce. Good to see you. Hey, Tracy. Good to see you again. Hi from Nebraska. Hello. All right. What do I think about Wix as a hosting platform for course creators? Ah, uh, so... Like if I was going to, I don't think I'd put my course on Wix um, simply because there's better options available for it. Like as far as website builders, I just made a video actually. HubSpot's one is probably my favorite right now. Um, I think if you look back at the video, not last video, but the one right before that, free website builder, free hosting, awesome platform, very powerful. I'd put my website there, but I'd put my course somewhere else because a course has all kinds of... Um, management and and data to it and all the videos and the the topics and the lectures and the communications and all of that so not my favorite have i read gorilla marketing by levinson yeah of course it's a classic gorilla also gorilla commonly misspelled g u e r r i l l a um different type of gorilla but fantastic fantastic stuff the other book i think that you'd find interesting if you like gorilla marketing is primal branding another good book at what are the top agencies in your area and can someone outside the country apply the top agencies in your area and can someone outside the country apply so there's two questions here the first of which is that anyone can apply anywhere in the world um always even if they say it's like we're only hiring local yeah you'd be surprised it's like people want the best talent so if you're the best then you can work anywhere um the top agencies in my area i mean I can't just list them off because they're gonna be different depending on web design, say social media and, um, and PPC and things like that. So also not as relevant. Like if you're looking for a job, my area won't be as good as other areas or that area or whatever it is. So you're gonna to wanna to find what, what's specific and interesting to you. Is Facebook new terms January 23? Whoa, there we go. Resizing things. Um, will affect the ads badly, like more strict? Yeah, fun time. So, Ads are always getting more strict and uh, and they're going to continue regardless of um, of new rules and new regulations that come in and uh, how this is going to impact imp advertisers and what's allowed on the platform, what's not allowed. So yes, things are always getting more strict. Um, will it affect ads badly? I guess it depends on what your definition of badly is. It's like people have been bashing different kinds of advertising and different kinds of regulations and terms of service and updates since they started like legitimately the first thing came out and it was such a land grab like i remember back back in the day makes me sound so old but like back in the day a decade ago when we ran facebook ads it was like legitimately the wild west we would just do anything like we, we had all of this i don't want to say spammiest ads but it would be like hey we have this thing you want to buy it and it'd be this ugly image with like a red border and we we would get away with anything we wanted we had befores and after pictures we had claims um which we felt were uh legitimate still obviously ethical be ethical um but they're still against the terms of service today and we got away with it and then they cracked down more and they cracked down more and we adapted and we were incredibly profitable and other people got whiny and complainy 
it's a word and uh and they left and we took all of the um the real estate from them so yeah it, that's the name of the game it's always going to become more competitive just um got to get on it yeah Thank you for the, the call to action. Smash like everyone. Yes, it's helpful for the algorithm. So I do appreciate uh, I do appreciate the like button tap. In fact, that is the only price to admission today. And in fact, as you may have noticed, here one sec, interesting news coming up. Ah, uh, there we go. As you may have noticed, there should no longer be a super chat, super thanks, super sticker, super whatever things uh, below this video, which means we're going to find another way to feed kids. Because before, like I mentioned, uh, all of the money from those were getting donated to help feed kids before, during, after school, kids in the, the area here that can't afford it. Um, but I'm going to find another way to do it because I'd like more of the money to go straight to them and less through the platform. So working on that one. Paul, would you give us 60 seconds on the guitar and amp? Yeah, one day. I totally will. I totally will. Maybe um, maybe towards the tail end of either this one or next time. Because I think I appreciate your interest. I don't know if enough people are that I want to bore them with uh, with guitar and amp. But yeah, I play, I play all the time. So we'll, we'll have to do that at some point. Um, oh, hang on. This one I wanted to hit first. How to be a digital marketing strategist? Yes. Okay, so videos. On the channel, not, I'm going to have to make some sort of catalog or search engine. I talked about this last time. If anybody knows anyone, let me know. Um, search engine for the videos. I think Gary Vee has one that's pretty pretty powerful. Uh, but how do you become a digital marketing strategist? So there's the, the short answer and the long answer. The short answer is you study digital marketing and you try to do as much of it as you possibly can in as many different areas for as many different people. And you slowly build up... Uh, um, a portfolio of experience from a bunch of different areas so that you can start to combine them. So the way that I like to think of digital marketing is almost like a chessboard. And the chessboard is business and you've got competitors, the market, all that's on the other side and then you're over here. Now what a lot of people do is they'll focus on like uh, social media. So that's, I don't know, one of the nights. And they'll focus on um, web design and that's like a, a rook. I'm going to run out of chess terms here very quickly, but bear with me. And then you'll have like all these other pieces. And essentially when you learn all of the different pieces, then you can start to combine them strategically in order to, to form an offensive or defensive plan of attack. And that's strategy. You don't need to start there. You start by learning the pawns and then, which is like say posting to social media, learning the different platforms. Then you learn uh, uh, castle, which is like video and how to create short form. And then you learn the other castle, which is long form video. And you just slowly start to accumulate the pieces. And then it's almost like building a puzzle where the, the image starts to reveal itself after you've accumulated enough pieces. That, that was supposed to be the short answer. That was a long answer. The short answer is I've got a video on it. So um, you can go check that one out. Okay, ready. My head of marketing said CPA, for those not familiar, that would probably be um, cost per acquisition, usually goes up during election season in BFCM. So one strategy is to turn off ads during this time or resume in January. January. Are there any other events like this in the year? Okay, so we've got a couple acronyms, BFCM. I don't know what that one is, but we'll, we'll, we'll just go with it. But the question is, are there times of year when ad costs go up? Should we turn off our ads? Here's my suggestion. First of all, there's tons of times like this throughout the year, depending on what industry you're in. For example, if you're selling health and fitness products, January, unsurprisingly, costs go through the roof because everybody and their dog wants to advertise health and fitness and weight loss things for January for the New Year's resolutions. Same thing happens around, say, spring break and prior to summer, you're going to see cost spike. If you're selling snowboard equipment, on the other hand, you're going to see cost spike in September and October and possibly around November as people are getting ready for the preseason and they're buying all their stuff there. So every different industry, gardening, how about spring, early spring, late winter? So depending on what industry you're in, you're going to see Costco. Now, that's the micro level. The macro level is the ad platform as a whole. Yeah, we see ad costs go up. Election, I don't, I don't think it has to do with, I mean, yes, elections, people are spending money on advertising for elections, but it has more to do with the fact that it's around like Black Friday and Thanksgiving and the holiday season and Christmas and things like that. So you will see ads go up. You turn them off if you don't care that you're not doing a Black Friday sale, you're not selling anything for holiday season, and your cost per acquisition is too high, you turn them off. On the other hand, if you're trying to capitalize on all of this and everybody's in a buying mode and you're able to um, to make a positive ROI, then you leave them on. So it's very case-by-case uh, -case specific. Hey, Adam, Dwayne here from South Africa. Dwayne, good to see you as well. What would be the best way to market an administrative support business? Okay, so the best way to market 
admin support. Where's my paper here? Um, the modern marketing plan, essentially, it's like it's going to be the best way to market most businesses. So model market message media machine. So figure out, all right, well, what is our business model? How are we making our money? What is the value prop that we're providing? Who is the ideal market? What are their pains and problems? Where are they present in active online and offline? What is the best sequence and, and marketing funnel that I can put in front of them to walk them strategically through the steps? But again, what I want to do here, and, and it's almost, it's almost a similar answer I have for most, but it's like, okay, well, who are the buyers of the administrative support business? And then who are the decision makers of that? So are you going after solopreneurs? Are you going after large businesses? Are you going after, are you in a B2B space? All of those are going to dramatically change the approach that you use. Like if you're going after, say, just solopreneurs, people, one, one person businesses, I might just run Facebook ads, or I might create content on LinkedIn, or I might, um... Where else would I go? Maybe some smaller Reddit communities. On the other hand, if I'm B2B, I'd definitely be using LinkedIn organic content. I might try targeted ads, but again, it's going to depend on the market more so than the business. I think that's the big thing that I really want to get across here is like, if you can, any business that you have, it's less about the business and it's more about the people that you're selling to. That's going to provide a better strategy than the actual business because the business and like the benefits and the features and all of that, that's, that's important, but, but that's kind of easy. The harder part is figuring out, well, who are the people? Why are they buying this? What are the results that they're hoping for? All right. Also, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, my friend. Uh, to Marco, good morning. With creating a marketing website with web host, what web hosting server would you recommend for speed and safety shared or cloud servers? Oh, you have so many different options. I mean, like an infinite amount of different options. I think it's almost like the wrong question because it's just inconsequential. Like it's just not that big a deal. Anyone is going to be fine. Honestly, they're all fine. So whatever you like, um, I'd use like start with a free one, go with um, HubSpot's free website hosting and free website builder. I've got again, I've got a link to that one on a previous video. I think it was like how to get a website for free. But again, just not a big enough deal to matter. So pick one, build it. You can always research it later. They're all pretty safe. They're all fast enough. Um, look at the stats, compare them against each other. All right, just Serio, what would be your advice for people who are becoming marketing managers who will be responsible for all marketing channels of the company? So what's my advice for people who are becoming marketing managers and they're responsible for all the marketing channels of the company? So many, so many things. If I had to boil it down into a, a shorter pithy answer, it would be to make sure that all of them were driving towards the main goal that I wanted to achieve so that I didn't get lost or confused or, or have the data diluted across things that I just don't give a crap about. Like really what's going to happen is the more channels that you're overseeing and the more people you're overseeing, the more likelihood there is for them to unintentionally snow you about, about like, Hey, this one's performing really well. Cause we have like a thousand likes. Um, whereas like this one only has two likes, but Oh, Hey, but it generated $40,000 in sales. So again, you've got to be clear on what are the main objectives that you are measuring for. If your superiors, the people that are in charge of you are not telling you it's revenue, it's revenue. Um, and if they're telling you it's like engagement, brand awareness, um, responses, et cetera, et cetera. I'd be like, cool. Can we tie this to revenue? Because the better you're able to do that, the more money you will make and the more that you will be, uh, loved and respected by your company. Santa, if you know, Hey, my fave YouTuber and marketing friends. Oh, you're too kind. Good to see you, Leah. Uh, I want to ask two things, how to start as a copywriter. I'm so lost. Also, do you recommend any course resource about how to use keyword in blog posts? Okay, great question. So how to get started as a copywriter. Fun fact, I actually just made a video. It is being edited now on copywriting 101 for beginners. So that one would be good. Um, courses, resources about how to use keywords and blog posts. I think what I would probably do is, uh, first of all, Neil Patel has a lot of good stuff on like SEO optimizing blog posts. So I would check out his stuff. He's got a ton of stuff. Um, I prefer his website articles over the YouTube videos because they're going to give you everything in sort of like written form and you can go through it. And there's a lot of good stuff. He's got, he's written some, his writers have written some, there's good things there. How do you get started as a copywriter is you, um, you, this is going to sound 
trite, but bear with me. You write a lot, like like everything that you can think of. Some of it you publish, some of it you don't. Ideally, more of it you publish than not. You write emails, you try to write website copy, you read websites, you analyze things, you look for what they're doing. You, um, you pick up some of the basic books on copywriting, like... Dan Kennedy's uh, Ultimate Sales Letter, or sale, yeah, Ultimate Sales Letter. You pick up books by uh, Ray Edwards, who's got books on Copywriting 101. You look up other copywriters, and you just start to go through their stuff. Um, ideally, you would also look back over the old guys, like Claude Hopkins, uh, Eugene Schwartz, um, Robert Collier, like all the old school copywriters. I've got their books are lining my shelves. They're amazing. I, I can almost promise, like if you read through those, you'll know more than you ever wanted to know. Um, and that should help. All right. Field grow web design agency. Hey Adam, good morning. Good morning. This is digital Harshi from India. Good to see you. Let us know your thoughts about product management and what we need to do. Um, I don't know what you mean. Like, do you mean how to become a product manager? Do you mean like taking inventory of things? Uh, I'm going to need more specifics on that one. You're going to have to fill me in on that one a little more what you're looking for. Let's see. Ah, just found your channel a couple weeks back. Binge watching everything. Good stuff. Really amazing work. Love from India. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're finding it valuable. That's the whole that's the whole point of this. Any videos that you would definitely recommend watching or any playlists, do let me probably know. Oh, where would I start? I'd probably start with... Um, I think I've got a playlist called like new here, start here. So I would start with that. Then what I would do is I would type in Adam Earhart and whatever keyword you're interested in. So Facebook ads, content marketing, web design, SEO, marketing strategy, whatever. And if you put in my name and that word, you're going to find like a list of all of the videos there. And then I would just start going down the rabbit hole of things you're interested in. The best way to learn marketing is to pull on the thread of the, um, of the sweater of curiosity that you happen to be most interested in because that's going to lead to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Like once you've read everything you could ever hope to read about content marketing, you're going to be like, cool, what's next? Now what, what do I do? And, uh, and that's what will lead you to the right place. All right. Thanks Adam. Dang autocorrect. I know it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. It's all good. I've spelled it. So fun fact, um, before I knew like gorilla, I messed it up all the time. And even now, I still can't like fully remember. I think it's G U E R R I L L A, but it's like those two Rs, man. They get you. Mason, what are your thoughts on IG pages that reach out for aggregate marketing? Basically, I'm fading subscriber numbers to look to make you look better. Is that worth paying for? Um, my answer is no. I don't think it's worth it. I think it's a bad strategy. I think it um, not only is it fake and doesn't really do you much good. Uh, but it can also hurt your page in the long run. That said, Instagram's pages are hurting anyway. Um, that said, now here's a caveat. If you can find a way to, I'm still not a big fan of this strategy, but you can find another strategy or, or something of equal, less ominous um, approaches to like get those first like hundred or thousand subscribers. There is something powerful that happens with social proof when someone's like, hey, this person's actually worth listening to. I guess I'll follow them. Uh, that just doesn't happen when you have like two subscribers, 10 subscribers, 100 subscribers. So yeah, I, I'm a big fan of getting them quickly. I just don't like that way. Like buying subscribers never works out. Um, this is a quick one. We'll do this one. As you know, I'm from India. Yes. How can I target US or abroad clients for designing businesses? It's the same way that anyone in the US or abroad targets anybody. So it's like, no matter where you live, you're you're located in one spot geographically, right? So it's like, even if you're in like downtown Manhattan, New York City, I don't even know what the population of that is, 10 million around New York-ish, we'll say 20 million, tons and tons of people. Even there, you're kind of capped if you want to go to other places. Um, or you're still going to need to use similar strategies. I think you could saturate your business just fine there. But regardless, you're still going to need to use other approaches, which is going to come down to outreach and networking and content creation and inbound marketing and advertising and everything else that we talk about here. So location and geography are no longer a factor. Um, fun fact, I live in a smaller town. Uh, I made that decision prior to our interconnectedness. And I, in the early days, I was like, hey, I'm willing to sacrifice revenue to be in a smaller place just because I like it here and I think it's it's great and I don't really want to be downtown in a big city. Um Fortunately, things changed in my favor where people got more comfortable doing business with other um, remote workers and things like that. And so it's not only been 
beneficial to be quote unquote remote or somewhere different, but it's, um, it's been a lot more, a lot easier and a lot more fun as well. So I don't think you're, you're limited. Danita, good morning, Adam. Danita from Cincinnati, Ohio. Good to see you. Glad you could make it here. Um, no clue why my question was skipped. Could be any number of reasons, including that I missed it or I thought it was answered previously. That's just typically the reason. There's a lot of questions. Sufi, what do you think candy marketing? What you think candy marketing is good for e-commerce businesses? Candy marketing. Have I ever sold candy? I've sold cakes and pastries and cupcakes and local. What do I think is good for candy? Um, the biggest thing I think I would say is finding the unique value proposition or, or a point of differentiation, because whether we're talking about candy or coffee or anything else that could be viewed as a commodity, it's not the product, it's the brand and the story and the, the unique point behind it that's going to help you increase sales. I could give you small things like put together packages or test this price or do this thing, but none of that is going to have, a, have an impact compared to actually creating a reason why your candy is like the best and here's why. Nick, definitely interested in hearing you shred. Yeah, one day, one day. I think I've got some like clips of, of it in um in different videos, but uh but yes, one day live. Maybe maybe we'll do that. We'll do like a jam session. Um architectural sheet metal, what revenue stream would you focus on to start driving revenue quickly? We're a metal roofing channel who's gaining the attention of brands and our following is crossing 10k across all platforms. Okay, awesome. So what revenue stream would you focus on driving revenue quickly? The fastest way to drive revenue is one-on-one -on -one coaching, consulting, services, etc. So like legitimately being like, hey, do you have a business that you want to grow, start, whatever? Do you have a sheet metal project that you want to do? Do you have a roofing thing that you want to do? Do you want to, whatever it is, and providing one-on-one -on -one coaching, consultation, whatever you want to call it, to a business or a person. Fastest way, full stop. Um, also the most lucrative and profitable way because your margins are the highest, um, not the most scalable way. Uh, you may or may find it the not the most fun way or whatever it is, but like that's by far the fastest way. Um, then once things start to take off and like, who knows, like 10K in a niche field is, is a large audience, right? It's like you can reach out to brands and be like, hey, we've got this audience. They're a captive audience that's really interested in this thing. Here's the value of this, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get brand deals and so on, but that's not the fastest way. Okay, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Yes, I think that's tying back to our question about um, ad costs and, and rising in there. All right, Chris. Good morning, Chris. Good to see you. Super simple question. When you say offer in all your videos, do you mean the service you offer or do you mean the way you present, frame your service? Oh, great question. Not even, not even super simple. Nuanced, detailed question. When I say offer, I kind of mean offer all of it. So let me explain. When I say offer, I mean the service or the product or the message or the idea, like whatever it is that I'm trying to communicate and, and get across and get you to believe in or do, that's my offer, of which a part of that is the presentation of the offer. So the, the better answer is hey, if this is your offer, it's going to be whatever service you provide, whatever product you're selling, whatever idea or message you're trying to communicate, that's your offer. And then all the things that go into it, like the reducing risk and adding scarcity and decreasing time to achievement and, and all of those other elements that go into successful offers, that's more the presentation and packaging of it. They're all kind of related. So kind of semantics, but also very important. So yes, when I say offer in my videos, that's what I'm talking about. Hope that made sense. Hannah. Hey, Hannah. Good to see you. Off topic, what are the questions that will need to be answered to form an LLC? Okay, yes, talk to your lawyer. I wish I could give you a better answer, but I am um, not qualified to act as that. But in my experience by forming LLCs, not a heck of a lot. I mean, you basically just like, hey, I wanna, I wanna make a company. And they're like, cool, it'll cost you two grand. And you're like, here's my money. And they say, great, now you're a company. So it's actually pretty simple, that, but that's what lawyers and accountants are for. And I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, as you may have tell, told by that um, answer. Okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, Dwayne, are linked ads worth it compared to Facebook ads? Short answer, no, not normally. I wish they were, and I wish there could, I wish I could find a way where I could justify it, but 
I've talked to many, because uh, I don't personally run LinkedIn ads anymore at all. Uh, and when I do think about it, I call my friends who run LinkedIn ads and they tell me the results they're getting. And I tell them, because we're friends, so I can say this. I was like, that's not very good. And they're like, yeah, we kind of know, but they're targeted. And I was like, yeah, but that's very expensive. Um, so you can reach the same people because it's not like people only use LinkedIn. It's like they use LinkedIn, but also probably Facebook or LinkedIn, but also probably YouTube. LinkedIn, but also probably Google. So you can reach them in other places for like pennies on the dollar that LinkedIn costs. Will that always be the case? No, I hope I hope not. I hope they get it a little bit better. Um, but for now, that is what we deal with. All right, quick um, quick community, community mention here. Uh, comments. I'm going through these and getting to them as I can. However, some will get skipped, some intentionally, some unintentionally. So uh, bear with me. Be kind, help other people, and uh, and easy on the chat there with the same same comments there, guys. All right, Mystique, I have a following on TikTok of over 1.4 million. That's amazing. Good for you. But the revenue doesn't reflect that for my energy healing services. Oh, we have a lot to talk about here. How do I continue to add value to my audience and convert them? Oh, I like this question. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, I have good news and bad news, like like most things. Uh, I'm gonna get some water, and then we're gonna we're gonna hit this one pretty hard. Okay, two things that we got to cover. Number one of which is the platform of TikTok itself and the policies and the monetization and the rewards and um, and the promotions that it runs. And number two is the attitude of the consumer, the viewer, the audience on TikTok itself. So let's do that one first, the audience. The difference between, say, TikTok and other platforms is TikTok is very... Uh, binge watching focused. It's very transactional. It's very quick content. They're trying to change it. They have longer TikToks of up to a few minutes or whatever it is. But it's like, if you think about the average way that a user goes through TikTok, right? It's just like, bam, 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 just cycling through things, cycling through. Duh, 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 duh. You don't really have an opportunity to build trust or a connection or rapport. So it's, it's very transactional content where it's like, I'm getting a quick hit of dopamine and then I'm on to the next thing. So that's the viewer. The other side of it is the way that the TikTok business model works is it's not incentivized or positioned to reward creators for the value that they're creating on the platform. This is why um, VidCon is a really good example. It's like if, if the last VidCon, I wasn't there, but this is what I've been told by many people that were there. They had a bunch of influencers show up, some from TikTok, some from YouTube. And the um, and there were very few fans representing TikTok influencers and everyone for YouTube. Because with YouTube, you're able to build a more personal connection, more, more rapport, more relationship. Like you get a feel for who people are. Whereas on TikTok, it's very superficial. Uh, so that's step one. The second thing is that the way they monetize the content is just poor. It's just terrible. They have a very bad monetization strategy. So here's what people are doing. People from TikTok are moving over to YouTube, starting with YouTube Shorts. So that's step one. You take your TikTok content. Ideally, you've got it recorded separately so you don't have to download it, remove the watermark, get it up on YouTube Shorts. But you get it on YouTube Shorts and you start doing, especially if you've got 1.4 mil on TikTok, I'd be doing like two or three Shorts a day for the next couple months uh, and, and trying to build that up. And then I would also start introducing more long form videos. Again, we don't have to get into the details too much here, but it's like YouTube is introducing better shorts monetization starting in February. Um, we, we don't know if that's going to be much more profitable, but I can tell you personally that the money that YouTube pays out is um, in my mind insane. Like it's just crazy how, how good or how high it is and, and can be. Um, compared to everything else, which is why I think they're going to eat TikTok's lunch. Okay. I think that's beneficial for everyone. Essentially, if you've got your strategy tied up in TikTok, I want you to start moving it over to YouTube Shorts, like today, immediately. Um, how to do marketing and sales in the banking sector. Ooh, Afik. Um, yeah, I've done a lot, actually, in the, in the sale, pardon me, in the banking, insurance, financial sector. It's not my favorite. Uh, and here's why. It is heavily regulated. So you've got to find out what you can say and what you can't say. And then you've got to find a way to actually, I'm going to turn my heat down here. I've got my window open for cold air and then I've got my heater going. It's wasting power. It's not good for the environment. 
but you've got to figure out what you're allowed to say and what you're not. Um, and then take a look at like what all the big banks are doing and then don't do any of that because it's normally terrible. Uh, they're, they're watered down. It's very vanilla. It's very boring. See what you can do different. Uh, take a look at like Virgin uh, Airlines, Virgin Atlantic, any of the Virgin companies, Richard Branson's companies, and see how they're doing their marketing and see what you can learn from that. Uh, Jire, hey, Adam from South Africa. Hey, Jire, good to see you. We got Dwayne also in South Africa. It's fantastic. Um, Philip, if you were given Twitter to run, but no executives, just developers, what customers would you target? Ooh, that's a fun question. Hypothetical. Adam owned Twitter instead of Elon. No executives, just developers. What customers would I target? You know what I would do is I would focus on... Um, I'd focus on the existing user base by far. So I would go for my most active users there and, and it's pretty, pretty varied, but a lot of like tech, I'd, I'd steer away from the political stuff. I'm not, I'm not much of a political person, but it's like tech, um, news, it gives you the ability to talk to people that you normally can't reach in other platforms. For example, I'm, um, I'm very hard to reach via email. I don't check email. Um, it, the, my inbox is overwhelming, so I'm, I'm not hard. I'm hard to get a hold of there. My phone is also a terrible way to get a hold of me, uh, because I don't check my phone. Um, I've got it there, but it's in like either airplane mode or I've got it only favorites. Only like my wife can give me a call, um, because otherwise it just lights up all the time. So the only way to really kind of like maybe get a hold of me is in the YouTube comments, which I'm, I'm still do my best to like get to at least for the new videos and possibly Twitter. The same thing goes with other places is, um, or other people that are normally kind of hard to get to is they're often present on Twitter. So I would double down on those. I'd make sure that my quote unquote influencers were happy as we saw with the exodus from Instagram influencers leaving because they weren't, um, they were basically voicing the opinions of most of the users. So I would tune in there, but yeah, that's it. And then I might just let it run for a while. And just see what kind of happens. And um, I don't think they need to change too much other than their ad platform is very bad. Very bad. And that's how you make their money. But they still made a lot of money. So there we have it. Uh, Jerry, what's the best way to grow a radio station YouTube channel? Interesting. Radio station YouTube channel. No one's ever asked me that before. I'm going to say that it's the best way similar to growing, say, a podcast YouTube channel, which will be to, um, I don't know how, how, how much of this is doable or reasonable, but here's what you're going to do. You try to find the most interesting and relevant and topical guests and content. And like you would with any marketing strategy, then you set up one, two, three, four different cameras. You get all the angles. You make sure you've got good audio and good video quality. And you basically turn it into a video style show podcast, whatever it is. Um, and you just pump out content from there. I'd take clips of my content and I would turn that into shorts, which would drive back to my long form videos. That is exactly what I would do. All right. Web design versus Facebook ads. What do you recommend for beginners? What are you better at? They're totally different. It'd be like, um, should I do uh, calculus or fine art painting? Um, maybe they're not that different, but like they're still different. So are you more of a copywriter? Are you better with words? Are you better with crafting compelling offers and all of that? Or are you better at designing good looking websites? Um, one does not equal the other. I can tell you confidently. I started personally with web design and moved to Facebook ads, but had I started just with Facebook ads, I probably would have done even better. All right. Bruce, being a newbie to the digital marketing world, is there a one-stop shop to start learning the step-by-step -step process in the area of marketing strategy? So obviously I'm biased here. So do your own due diligence and make sure that this is right for you. But this is my best attempt after a decade of doing this to put together a one-stop shop as the, as the starting point for what you need to know for marketing strategy, digital marketing strategy, everything to sort of start putting the pieces together. As far as thinking there will ever be one thing that does everything forever, it's a bit nuts. So for example, every year I sign up for new email marketing courses. I hire new mentors for video marketing. I hire everyone and anything that I can think of. I hire agencies. I hire, uh, buy all the courses. I buy even more books. I'm always learning and trying to grow and upgrade and all of that. Now, a lot of that is filtered down into this. So I think it's the best representation of, um, of what you need to know. But again, due diligence and clearly I'm biased. So take a look. Do 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 do. I'm on top three tips. 
How about top, top one tip? We don't have all these time, all this time. We've got to get to so many questions. How to grow an ed tech product, educational technology product. Top three tips. Let's see what I can think of that would be on how to grow an ed tech product. I'm going to give you two. That sounds fair. Number one of which is like you've got to find out the um, the unique position of this ed tech product, any product versus everything else out there. So there's so much competition and so many different things out there that everything you want to do has been done before, but that's fine. That's cool. That's business, guys. We just need to find a new and innovative way to present why ours is better. The second is content marketing for it. You've got to create all the content around it and you have to almost try to answer the questions that someone would have prior to going into that. So I don't know, let's say it's like, Grade five math. Well, all of your content should be on grades one, two, three, and four math to move them in to where grade five math is the next logical conclusion of it. Same again, if I pull up that thing here, my recommendation is depending on whether you have more time or money, if you have more time, don't look at a course, go through every video that I have on the channel, watch them all, pen and paper. Um, I don't know what there is, 40, 80 hours, 100 hours of content, some ridiculous amount of stuff. Go through all of that. On the other hand, if you're looking for a more condensed version, you can go there or you can do them in order. Start there, and do the other one. So again, it's going to come down to making sure that there's a logical sequence that's going to provide people the most value possible. Justin, will AI take up digital marketing jobs in the future? Share your thoughts. It sounds like a game show thing. Adam, will this happen? Share your thoughts. Um, will AI take up digital marketing jobs in the future? Yeah, some. But like, that's okay. Because it's going to take up the boring stuff you don't want to do anyway. Um, what's a good example? Like social media, posting, scheduling, research tools, crawling. What else? Um, certain kinds of like AI generated graphics, video editing is already, it's like, you should see the video editing AI software that I use that takes, I'll get to that in actually just a second. Um, so yes, it's going to take some jobs, but I don't, it doesn't bother me at all. Like we'll just get better and we'll do the things that AI can't do. Like, like I said, I think in a previous video, AI still can't even come close to competing with the quality of content that humans can write. So it's like, it's getting close. It's okay for like superficial stuff, but like really compelling content and ads and things like that, humans still beat it. They might give us a starting ground to jump off, but whatever it is. Um, I use a piece of software called ReCut, R-E-C-U-T. And what that does is I'll record a video just like this. And odds are good that I'll mess something up or say something wrong or stumble or whatever it is, stutter, Wh whatever. I hit record. I record the entire thing. Say it takes me half an hour to record a video. I'll then take that so footage. I'll put it into recut. Recut goes through based on the parameters that I've set and it looks for every pause or break and it cuts that section out. And in the end, I end up with a perfectly, almost perfectly cut video that I can then send to editors and we can do zooms and graphics and titles and that. But it like, it cut, it saves, I don't know, at least a good hour or two of like rough cut editing for every video, which is huge. So yeah, AI's coming. I think it's great. Um, just make sure that you're more valuable than a computer and we'll be good. <clears throat> All right. Hamed, I'm not very engaging. Oh, I lost my, there we go. When I speak to camera, any advice? Yeah, um, two pieces of advice. Number one, look back at my very first videos on the channel. I'm, I think I still have some of my very, very first ones there, but it's like, they're blurry, they're out of one side. Um, I'm super sweaty. I don't think you can tell how sweaty I am, but I'm so sweaty. Like, I'm just miserable. Like, just horribly uncomfortable. Uh, it was awful. Like it was just the least fun experience ever. And I remember making a bunch of these videos and, and finishing and being like, well, that sucked. Uh, and it took me like four hours to make like a four minute video. Cause I had to just keep redoing it. And so, um, that's practice. That's it. Like that's step one. So the best thing you can probably do is a couple things. Number one is like, get yourself a little bit amped up ahead of time. So if you have favorite music or something you can do to sort of get in the zone, like you do need to up your intensity a little bit because the camera, like, you know, they say the camera adds 10 pounds. It kind of also drains like 20, 30% of your energy. So if I talk like how I normally, actually, I normally talk a bit, a bit hyper anyway, but regardless, um, so I just have to maintain a, a normal level and that comes off a crow. Okay. But like for most people, if they talk like they normally talk, it's going to come out like this because this is how you would have a conversation and you'd think and you'd listen and it would just be like, oh man, people would be gone. So you're going to have to ramp it up a little bit and then practice. So turn on the camera, record it, try it, 
Look it back, watch it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. Just practice makes perfect. That's really it. Um, you don't have to show it to anyone. Just record yourself a few times and, um, and get comfortable. Put on clothes that you like. Put on, um, set up your office so it feels good. And then again, practice. All right, Tracy, back to my question as a prof EOS implementer. Yes, EOS, entrepreneurial operating system. Coach, I offer a free 90-minute meeting to entrepreneurial companies. How best to market and using the required microsite. Okay, so if you have a microsite that you're required to use, so um, a landing page, like a lot of the times different businesses and that are going to have like uh, required marketing materials you have to use. First of all, I try to optimize my microsite as much as possible. I make sure that it's compelling and there's testimonials and reviews and case studies and promises and offers and all the things that you need in a proper site. The second thing is, is that you offer a free 90 minute meeting. That's a long meeting. Um, especially for like an initial overview. Like even if I thought it was incredibly valuable and I wanted it, I'm not sure I have 90 minutes, right? It's like, you're, that's asking a lot. Could we cut it down? Could it be 45 minutes? Could it be 15 minutes? Could it be 20? Could it be 30? Could it be 60? Like, are, are there other things that we can play with? Um, could we do a 15 minute one and then a complimentary follow up? So there's, there's different ways that I'd want to look at that. The second thing is that's where they're going to convert, but like, where are they coming from? And that's all my, <clears throat> that's all my traffic. So I still need traffic through content, through ads. I would probably be less likely to do. Um, but I'd be creating like tons and tons of LinkedIn content, driving them to my irresistible offer, which was my free call. And then I'd find a way to like reposition my call. So it's not a free call. It's, um, initial strategy session or help you map out your first quarter's goals or whatever it is. There's gotta be some kind of tangible value there for someone willing to take that kind of action. Most executives slash entrepreneurs, um, depending on where they are in their journey, I don't know many that are willing to hop on a 90 minute free call. In fact, I'd rather pay for the call because then I know I'm going to get value and I'm happy to just like leave early or, or peace out after like 20 minutes if I got everything I need. Um, time is the most valuable resource that we have later on in our journeys. Okay, Chris. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Good question. Excellent question. Oh, you mean eye candy marketing strategy? Eye candy versus just candy. I'm not sure I get the context there. Eye candy marketing strategy for e-commerce business. I don't even know what that means other than um, putting together stuff, um, visually appealing things. Yes, Chris, I echo your sentiments. I echo your sentiments, but I appreciate all of the, all of everyone here that's, that's doing their best and, and asking good questions. So all good. Thank you, my friend. All right, Adam, I'm a nutritionist specializing in helping people with anxiety. Good for you. And no matter how I change my messaging or state the benefits, I'm not getting any conversions. Should I give up? So the answer is no, you should never give up ever. In fact, the only way you fail is when you give up. Um, but I'm going to argue that not no matter how you change your messaging or state the benefits, you're not getting any conversions. Like we haven't tried everything yet, obviously, because the question that I want to ask you back is like, is there anyone in your space that is helping people overcome anxiety using nutrition? Is there anyone in there? And if the answer is yes, well, if they can do it, then you can do it too. Uh, that said, let me send you to, uh, you need to have a chat with Dr. Mark. Go talk to Dr. Mark. He's going to be the guy for you. Um, Dr. Mark Morris, you'll find him. I'm going to see if I can pull up his website. Dr. Mark. Cause that's his thing. Helping do, 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 Dr. Mark method. Here we go. Okay. I'm going to just drop this in the, actually here, go to drmarkmethod.com. D Dr. D R M A R C method.com. Um, and talk to him and he'll, he'll help you out uh, or have a chat with you. I can't guarantee he's going to help you out. Sorry, but, but chat with Mark. Awesome. Awesome dude. Um, the second thing is, is like, we've got to figure out the pain points of the people so that it's, it's interesting enough or relevant enough for them to take action. And they probably won't do it publicly. So if you've got something, it's like, Hey, are you struggling with anxiety? Leave a comment below. That's not something that are a lot of people like, yeah, yeah, I'm falling apart. Let me, uh, let me, let me just put my name right out there for everybody to see. Uh, so you might want to offer something else. You'd be like, Hey, look, 
this is a tough time of year for a lot of people. Going through the holiday season, we actually see a spike in, in anxiety and depression. If this is you, I want you to know two things. Number one, you're not alone. There are other people that go through this too. And number two, there is help and support. In fact, if you're if this is something that you're battling with, I've set time, um, I've set aside some time over the next few days to talk with you for 10, 15 minutes to give you some strategies and some advice. I've found that nutrition is the secret that a lot of people are overlooking and I'd like to walk you through my process for it. Get them on the phone. Talk to them about it. If no one converts, then we have a sales issue more so than an initial messaging issue. That advice should be relevant for everyone as well. Um, if you've got something like that where people just aren't converting, then you send, you make an offer like that. Hey, here's this thing. Here's this other thing. I can't remember exactly what I just said. We can rewind and rewatch it, um, but that will help. Josh, is there a better place to advertise other than Google ads for a towing company? Um, if someone Googles like, where do I find a tow truck? Then Google's the best place, full stop. If it's something, it's like, man, what should I do today? Should I um, should I get a tow truck maybe? That'd be fun. Then you could do Facebook ads in that, but that's, you and I both know that's not how it works. So it's like, this is very search-based. So the only other option is like Microsoft ads or wherever else, any other search engine that allows ads, because that is going to be how you um, you convert those kind of people. It's It's, Basically, search versus discovery marketing. Uh, on that note, Vitor, should I do Facebook ads or Google ads or both? It depends. Are people searching for a solution or is it something that would be interesting if you put it in front of them? For example, the other day I saw this product come up on Facebook ads that was like this um, camera follow system. So it's like basically you put in your phone and then you can walk around the room and it'll like track you. I'm like, that's sweet. I'd never heard of this thing. I didn't even know it existed. And, um, and that was a Facebook ad that would have never worked for Google ads because I wasn't going to Google and typing in camera tracking system for my phone. So hopefully that example points you in the right direction. Da -da -da -da. Chris, very supportive and kind today. We'll get another one. A uh, cliche question, but would be helpful. If you had to start over with all the skills you have now, what market would you target and what services would you offer? Yeah, I like this question. Um, and the reason is, is because I would target a local service-based business, mostly because I'd be able to get to like 10K a month, like instantly. Uh, like, like sounds, sounds um, what's the word? Sounds braggadocious, but like literally we'd be there in like a, a day, half a day. So what I would do is I'd find 10 clients, I'd charge them $1,000 each, uh, local service-based business, plumbers, roofers, um, possibly contractors, solar companies, anything that, that has a high enough ticket price. And then what I would do is I would offer them Google ads, SEO, possibly some social media stuff, but I'd focus on Google ads and SEO because again, search traffic, capturing the lead, translating that into sales, making the money, which makes me look good because I've just made the money. I would run them through this software. So what I would do is I'd run a Facebook pardon me, Google ads, and also probably a Facebook lead ad. Both of them will siphon into this software. I would send an SMS follow-up sequence and um, I'd be off to the bank. That'd be it. And we'd be at 10K in a day and 100K in like a month. Um, so hopefully that helps. Full gospel sermons. Good day, Adam. Good day. What's the best free email marketing platform for my list? Oh, there's so many. I don't like... Um, <coughs> I don't like free though. And here's why free means that they're going to put their, their brand and their stamp on it. And I don't want them to do that. I want it to be unbranded. I also want more control later so that I've got options to move things around and, and do this and that. And, um, and segment changing email list providers is a, a bit of an epic disaster. So what I'm going to do is da -da -da -da, I'm going to give you a paid one that you don't have to use because it is paid. Let me see if I can, there we go. Da -da -da -da. So here's my recommendation for paid. And then as far as free, I don't have a favorite. I really don't. Um, I don't, they're all fine. I'm not a huge fan of anyone in particular. So anything's fine, but, but my recommendation is go for free or go for a paid one. I think a has got a plan at like 30 bucks a month. Um, email marketing should be one of your highest ROI delivering vehicles. So it's like what I pay for email marketing a month is hundreds and hundreds of dollars, uh, because the list is of that size, but it provides an ROI and it allows me to deliver more value. So I would, 
I'd, I'd leave that last. I'm keeping that thing forever. Super Chai, good to see ya. You made it. Excellent, my friend. Tyler B., how did you find a community that helped you grow? Ooh, that's a good question. Good question, Tyler. I think... What, what did I do? I think what I did, and this is going to sound... Um, um, this is going to make me sound like more of a saint than I, than I probably deserve to sound like, but it, but it really was a strategic decision was like from the very early days, my goal, because this is what I was told was to just provide like the most insane amounts of value that I possibly could. So a lot of my competitors and a lot of people in the space were kind of like hiding some of their stuff or they didn't want to talk to people. They didn't want to give away everything. They didn't want to like go the extra mile. And I was told that I had to. Um, I learned this from Jay Abraham, the strategy of preeminence, basically becoming, um, having a fiduciary responsibility, like almost feeling like you have a legal responsibility to help someone. Like you have to help. This is your job. You provide value. And I think by doing that and just being almost like hell bent on providing as much value as I possibly can, well, you compound that over, I don't know how many years, like over 10 years now and five, six, I don't even know how many years on YouTube. Like you just compound that over time. And it's sort of a logical conclusion that you're going to build a community of people, of good people that that you resonate with. That's the other thing is like the vast majority of the community, all, all of you guys here today, awesome people, really good people, ethical people, good businesses, hard workers, um, like good people. But again, that's kind of because that's all I've been talking about for 10 years. It's never been about like scamming people or ripping people off or doing all this other crap that often gets spewed out in the marketing community. So yeah, just be good and help as many people as you can. And it's shocking. It sounds like such a garbage answer, but that's kind of, that's the secret. Hey Adam, how do I practice being more engaging in front of the pre uh, camera? Watch people that are engaging. And then I don't want to say copy them, but model after them and hit record, practice, watch yourself back, see what you can do to improve. Uh, Mystique, what email system do I use that regularly sends emails to your client instead of templated? Yeah, I don't like templated emails. I don't like HTML. I like plain text. I use da, 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 this and recommend it. Um, I think there's a free trial in there as well. So that is my, my go-to. It's pretty much the one I recommend for most businesses out there. Uh, answer that one already. Let's see. Danita, hey Adam, just started watching your channel. I have a candle company. I do very well in person sales, but not so good online. I usually get one sale per month. I post on IG about one time a week. Okay, so this is a combination of things. The first of which is the, is the quantity of content. So it's like to succeed on Instagram today, if there is such a thing, because it's kind of become a, a mess. Um, first of all, I'd move you over to YouTube Shorts. Um, yeah, that'd be step one. You can stay on Instagram. Like I'm, I'm assuming, especially with candle sales and that, like your market's probably heavy on Instagram. I'd also look at Pinterest. You'd be one of the few exceptions that I'd be like, go take a look at that platform. But like three times a week isn't enough. Like we're going to be looking at... This isn't, this isn't going to sound fun, but like three times a day, um, minimum once a day, minimum, minimum. So like, that's it. Then we need a balance of like value driven content, sales driven content. Uh, look at this software. Let me close that one out. This is what I'd recommend to use to like schedule your posts on Instagram. And then you'll be able to see what's performing well and what's not. Again, I think this will give you a free trial. So yeah, check that out. But that's it. Then it's just a question of like wash, rinse, repeat until we find the system and the message and the tone and the style and the frequency and, and all of the things. Basically everything else that um, there's a ton of stuff on the channel. So you're in the right place. All right. Let's see. Okay, Tracy. Yes, required 90 minute and yes, 15 minute initial. Okay, cool. So that's good. So yeah, we, we pitch the 15 minute initial and then on the 15, we pitch the 90 on the 90, we pitch the full service. So all roads need to lead to that 15 and we have to make it look as irresistible as possible. And then we drive traffic to it. That's really it. Like if we're not getting enough, um, like again, I, I made this in another video. It's, it's kind of about conversion rates. Like if you've got, I don't know, a hundred people that visit that page and five people sign up, well, you have a 5% conversion rate. So ceteris paribus, all things equal. If we drive 200 people, well, we now get 10. If we drive 400 people, we now get 20. We drive a thousand people, we now get whatever, whatever I said, 50. We'll go with that. So it's like, we often just need more traffic to go to it and then it converts. Um, fun fact, I learned the, the hard way, like I've been making courses for a lot of years and some have sold very well and some have lagged behind in that. 
uh, a lot of it came down to traffic and like simply getting enough people to go see the thing that you have, knowing that most people won't, but the ones that want to are going to resonate, they'll convert and they'll, they'll go through, but we often just need more traffic. Okay. Let's see. Chris. Yeah. My pleasure, buddy. Um, okay. Ooh, a couple more minutes and then I got to go have, um, second breakfast. Second breakfast time. Pancakes with the kids. Hey Adam, I have many passions. I want to convert them into a business, but it's overwhelming. How can I niche down to the best passion to make into a business? This is a good one. We might end on this one. Let's end on this one because I think it's going to help the most amount of people and I, I want to do it justice. Here's the deal. Passion, oh, this is going to be a cliche or it's going to be a saying. Passion doesn't equal profit. Uh, in fact, many times your passions are going to be things that are going to be terrible to make out of a business because A, not enough people are going to want them or B, they're just going to suck all of the fun out of doing the thing that you once really, really loved. Uh, so your passions, not all of them have to make money. That said, you do need to be interested and curious and, um, and somewhat passionate about what you're doing, but you've got to find, I'm not, I don't have a pen and paper around here. All right, we're visualizing here. Visualize with me, people. We've got three circles, a Venn diagram. Circle at the top, circle over here, circle over there, all overlapping. At the top, we have passions, also known as interests, also known as things we're curious about, things we like. For me, this is guitar and weightlifting and running used to be and drawing and painting and like all of these things that, that I'm interested in. Then we have this circle over here and this is skills. These are things that you're actually good at. For example, painting, I'm very passionate. I think it's amazing. I love painting. I find it interesting. Skills, oh, I'm so bad. Like, like terrible, like child level painting. So that's not good. But communication, also passion. I like communication. Psychology, I like. Okay, I'm good at that. I've, I've studied it. I, I understand it. I'm, I'm well at that. Then we need the third area, which is market demand. These are things that people are willing to pay for, which you can figure out by, do they have a problem that exists? And is the problem large enough that they would be willing to essentially pay money to have you solve the problem and where you have that overlap between things you're passionate about, things that you're skilled in and things that the market exists. There's market demand for, which you can do by looking up, are there competitors in the space? You can look at Google trends. You can, you've basically got to do some like grunt labor there. The overlap is the sweet spot and that's where your business can succeed. Um, but again, don't over leverage or don't over uh, hedge on passion because like skills and market demand, probably more important. And another fun fact, when you find something that you're really, really good at, you'd, you'd be surprised like how passionate you can become about it, especially when people start being really interested in it. And then it just, it all kind of feeds on itself. So skills, probably the missing link in most people's businesses. You've got to find the thing that you're really good at. And, and fun fact, if you're in the top like 5% of a skill, it's like you write your own ticket, six figures, seven figures, like eight figures. I mean, honestly, it's, it's up to you to write your own ticket once you've, once you become and, and work towards that skill. All right. I think that's it. Let's see. Final call to action, hit the like support and support the video. I think as well, support your answers, support other entrepreneurs, other marketers, other people that, uh, that can benefit from it. But that's it. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for being here for these wonderful questions. They were really good. I enjoyed the um, the questions. I enjoyed the engagement. It's so great to, to have you be a part of this. And uh, we should have a video coming out on Monday or Tuesday. And again, hopefully we can kick this off again next week. So thank you again. Have an amazing weekend. And uh, I will talk to you soon.